Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. And uh, you know, one of my favorite things to talk about is the gut microbiome. It's my favorite area of research. I teach a class on gastrointestinal disorders. It's one of my favorite things that I do. So I'm going to start today by talking about the gut microbiome. Healthy humans have over 100 trillion bacteria in their GI tract. And what these little critters do is they assist in the absorption of nutrients from food. Uh, they serve as a barrier system to keep things out of the bloodstream that should not be getting in, and they play a major role in immune function. Now, research has shown that changes in the microbiome accompany the development of almost all diseases, and research has also shown that the composition of the gut bacteria is in a major way affected by the diet. Poor diets result in the loss of bacterial diversity, and the proliferation of pathogenic bacteria, and good diets result in promoting bacterial diversity and the proliferation of more beneficial bacteria. Now, a recent study um, was, in my mind, very important because it showed that not only does diet affect the microbiome of the individual, but it can affect uh, future generations. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. The study was published in Nature. And uh, what researchers did was they fed germ-free mice human fecal samples, which quickly colonized the guts of these animals. The mice were then divided into two groups. One group of mice was given a high-fiber plant-based diet. The other was given a low-fiber diet. Now, when the study began, the gut bacteria of the two groups of mice were pretty similar. There were 213 species of bacteria in the control group and 208 species in the experimental group. After seven weeks, however, things got interesting. There was a reduction of 60% of the species in the mice fed a low fiber diet. And some species had been reduced so much that they were virtually undetectable. The mice eating a high fiber diet, on the other hand, there were reductions in only 11% of the bacterial species. Now, after 11 weeks, uh, after seven weeks, I'm sorry, the researchers placed the low fiber mice on the control diet, which included more fiber. Predictably, their gut microbiomes changed in response to this with increases even in some of the bacteria that had been lowered to almost undetectable levels. But 33% of the species, in spite of this, remained low or undetectable even after introduction of the high fiber diet. Now, the part of the study, the, this part of the study showed the profound effect that diet can have on the gut microbiome. Within a few weeks, eat terribly and things change for the worse. Within a short period of time, even after you've eaten terribly, adopt a better diet, things start to get better. But the fact that the mice were not able to fully recover as a result of the high fiber diet is an advertisement or an endorsement for why probiotic uh, treatment is also necessary when you're trying to restore a gut that has been damaged by poor diet, antibiotics, any number of things, gastrointestinal disorders. Now, there was another part of the study which I think was uh, incredibly fascinating. The researchers looked at the impact of varying diets on future generations of mice by breeding mice from the two original groups. After weaning, pups of low fiber mice continued to eat a low fiber diet for 10 weeks and their bacterial diversity predictably dropped. In the 11th week, they were switched to a high fiber diet. Each successive generation of mice got worse, and by the fourth generation of the 208 original bacterial species, 150 were completely wiped out, almost uh, three quarters. Only nine species were recovered on the high fiber diet. Now, all was not lost, however, when fourth generation low fiber mice were given fecal transplants from fourth generation high fiber mice. Within only 10 days, 110 of the lost species were restored. Now, the researchers cautioned that this study involved, involved mice, and um, many times research on animals doesn't carry over to humans, and that's true. But there are many studies in the medical literature showing that diet affects the gut microbiome, um, adverse changes in the gut microbiome can be remedied with a combination of uh, diet and probiotics, and that changes in the microbiome for the better or worse affect health. So we are not relying, I'm not relying on strictly this study to uh, make a hearty endorsement for eating the right diet to feed the right gut bacteria. Um, and that if you've had some damage, eat the right diet, take probiotics and restore your gut. And you may not be as good as new, but as close as you can get to it. So uh, fascinating research. And um, I'm very interested in the idea of how um, poor or good habits affect future generations. I think we're all a little bit concerned about that. All right, the other thing I want to talk about today is also a favorite topic of mine, which is cancer screening. 
And um, I'll just start by saying that accurate evaluation of a test, drug, or medical procedure depends on asking the right questions. And if you look at the wrong issues, you can be distracted from the right ones and you can come up with a whole lot of incorrect um, assumptions about things. Now, because cancer screening is an example. I mean, look at a lot of the discussion about cancer screenings and we're talking about who should get screened and when should screening start and how often should people be screened. But this is a real distraction, I think, from the real issue, which is whether or not cancer screenings actually reduce the risk of dying from cancer. Uh, a research group from Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland uh, weighs in on the issue and reports that cancer screening has not had an effect on overall mortality and that harms due to screening may actually have contributed to increased mortality uh, rather than decreased mortality rates. In other words, we may be har harming more people than we help. Not the first time I've talked about this and certainly not the first group of researchers who, or doctors who have said that this is the case. The harms include false positives, which can result in unnecessary biopsies and treatment, and false, um, uh, and false negatives and overdiagnosis, um, which can result in overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Um, and, uh, and often, when we talk about these false positives, the issue is that you may find something, you know, the whole idea is early detection, you find something, but if, it, if that something is a cancer that would never have caused symptoms and would never have required treatment for the entire life of the person, then you're engaging in overdiagnosis and overtreatment when you, do, when you find it and then you do something about it. So that's the issue. Now, cancer screening is promoted based on the assumption that early detection leads to more opportunity for successful treatment, which then lowers cancer-specific mortality rates. In other words, you're treated for breast cancer, so the death rate for breast cancer overall goes down. And then this leads to overall reduced mortality rates. But the Oregon State researchers say that the facts don't support this argument. Um, they cite data from the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial as an example. Uh, Low-dose CT screening resulted in a small relative reduction in deaths from lung cancer when compared to chest x-ray, but in absolute terms, it was absolutely minuscule. Now, chest x-ray is no longer the standard of care, and this change may have actually increased the death rate from lung cancer. And the reason is that because the more sensitive test is used, you find more cancers and there are 12,000 fewer deaths, but the corresponding other side of this is there are over 27,000 major complications resulting from treatment, which include lung collapse, heart attack, stroke, and death. So you save 12,000, you hurt over 27,000. The researchers encourage informed discussions, go figure, I've been talking about this for 20 years, between patients and doctors during, risk, during which risks and benefits are evaluated along with personal preferences of the patients. They wrote, quote, declining screening may be a reasonable and prudent choice for many people and added that, quote, doctors should be comfortable with whatever choice people make when they hear about all the potential benefits and the known harms. I've been saying this for years, and it is really refreshing for me to see this type of information ending up in publications like the British Medical Journal and coming out of organizations and institutions like the Oregon um, Health Science um, uh, Group. Much larger trials with millions of people would actually be required to determine if there is real value to cancer screening. But Gerd Gigerenzer, I probably butchered this guy's name, he wrote in an accompanying article that instead of spending millions of dollars on huge trials looking for tiny reductions in mortality, while we invariably will go on and hurt a whole lot more people, he says it would be better to just tell patients the truth. Um, love this guy about the limitations of screening and the limitations of the existing studies. He suggests, like from mammography, information about screening should be presented in fact boxes, he describes, that show the risks and benefits and state clearly how many women are affected. He wrote, quote, it is time to change communication about cancer screening from dodgy persuasion to something straightforward. Um, and again, this type of language in medical journals is just so refreshing to see. We need more of this. Richard Shilsky, chief medical officer for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, says that the value of screening depends on three things. These, there is the degree of risk for the condition being screened. That's the first one. 
The sensitivity and specificity of test is number two, and the prognosis for the disease detected. He says, for example, there's very little to be gained in screening for aggressive cancers for which there aren't any effective interventions because screening can't change the outcome no matter how early you find the cancer. On the other end of the spectrum, there is no benefit to knowing about a cancer that will never develop into anything, will never require treatment. This is how we suck people into the medical mill. We hurt more people than we help. Um, Shilsky says, all things considered, there just isn't much benefit. Now, this is a guy who is the chief medical officer for the American Society of Clinical Oncology. He went on to say that most doctors do not understand these issues and the system doesn't allow them the time to engage in these types of discussions about them, which is why we have for 20 years been telling people it is incumbent upon the patient in order to protect himself or herself to get this information and to analyze it himself or herself before consenting to or even engaging in a discussion with um, doctors and other healthcare providers about what to do. So this is a great day in my life and the life of Wellness Farm Health. The mainstream folks are starting to catch on to what we have been saying for 20 years. All right, so that's it for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you on uh, next week with more news.